got it turned off uh, so that it won't be distracted. You guys looking at me and I'd like to make this um, presentation as interactive as possible. So thank you. We have a um, wide group of, of people joining us today from different countries and that's really interesting uh, for me as well since I'm from Brazil. Um, and this first slide, uh, actually, I was just on vacation now, and as all good Brazilians and South Africans as well, I guess, we all love a beach, right? And, and I'm kind of like a beach bum. So uh, this is the beach where I went to in the northeast part here in Brazil. And I found this quote that uh, really encapsulates uh, my PhD journey, uh, and you'll understand why. Uh, so the quote is, for the ocean is big and my boat is small, find the courage. Uh, this quote has also been attributed to Alanis Morzat. Um, so I'm not sure that it really is an old red prayer. However, President Kennedy, uh, he favored this quote and used it quite often in, in his remarks um, at the dedication at the East Coast Memorial to the missing at sea. Well, I don't relate to being missing at sea, although at some point in my journey, my PhD journey, I felt like I was kind of missing at sea, but I was just trying, you know, to find the courage to sail, you know, some really rough, turbulent, you know, waves and all of that. So uh, this image really speaks to me in that sense. Um, so uh, this Martin has already given you a preview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, so I'll be doing some of my PhD hurdles and how I overcame these hurdles. I'm going to be presenting to you my study and sharing the key findings. Um, I'd like to explore some of the strengths and weaknesses of using case study methodology to generate theory that successfully translates into practice and finally discussing implications for professional development derived from the, the professional development guidelines uh, that I came up with based on my case study. Uh, so starting with the hurdles, um, in, the, in 2016, I defended my proposal. And actually, uh, my proposal was, um, what I had planned to do was use design-based research and I would uh, undertake an intervention in a K-12 public school here. Um, keep in mind that I do not work uh, neither in K-12 uh, public or private school nor in a higher education institution. Uh, so basically, I'm a stranger to both of these environments. Anyway, um, I got permission uh, to undertake this intervention in this K-12 school. Uh, and using design-based research, my first plan was um, to assess uh, teachers' intention to adopt and use OER using a quantita quantitative um, instrument. Uh, then after that, I would give them uh, do some, some design thinking workshops, which I did do in the end. Um, you'll see about that. And in the end, I developed this whole online course that would teach them in a practical way, really, uh, how to use, create, share, redistribute OER. And this course I did develop, and uh, it's being hosted in a federal university here in Brazil. But what happened a few months later, so this, so this was 2016, I had, I had had like three meetings with the teachers, um, and by 2000, 2017, when I was in Cape Town attending um, o, uh, the Global OE Conference, um, I was with my supervisor, uh, Rory McGreal, who is a, an amazing man for anybody who knows him. And um, with all the GoGN uh, team and members and the whole network, and I was like, you know, teachers, they, they're just not taking the course. And I had even offered them accreditation. And none of them were even accessing the course. And, and whenever I would, you know, send them emails or try phoning them, and, and they would just tell me that they never accessed their emails and that they didn't know how to access the course. And the course, of course, 
is hosted uh, in a Moodle environment. Um, so they just were not doing what I had planned for them to do. And by that point, I was kind of, you know, literally tearing my hair out um, and, you know, having a lot of sleepless nights and saying, well, so what, what do I do now? I mean, because everything I had planned, nothing was working out. And so this, after discussing a lot of it with Rory and we spent a lot of time together in Cape Town, um, he had come to Brazil already before uh, to give several talks and we had met on several occasions. I was like, well, you know, it gets to a point where you just have to make it work for you. And so then I decided to change my whole methodology, which was not an easy task because that entails rewriting um, most of my proposal. I had to submit to the research ethics board at, at the Basque University again. Um, I don't know what it's like in other countries. I think in England it's different, but in Canada, for those of you who are from Canada, um, a doctoral program usually takes anywhere between four to five years. So the first three and a half years, uh, you actually have to do all the coursework and complete all the coursework, and then you go on to your proposal. So by that time, I had finished my coursework and I was really working on my proposal. Uh, so lessons learned, um, which, I, which were a big takeaway for me, uh, was that basically at that point, I was kind of even questioning myself whether I should, you know, just stop writing this whole thesis or stop doing this doctoral program or, you know, forget about all my dreams of getting uh, intervention undertaken, but basically um, there are four, uh, I think, five key characteristics that I think are really important that help me get through these hard times, and one of them um, were, was persistence. So here I am, you can see me here on the screen, and I'm like climbing, or at least trying to climb, um, you know, to reach the summit here, and so <laughs> I'm facing a lot of difficulties. Uh, also, be flexible, be flexible enough so that you know, okay, I've got to change things. I have to change my methodology. I'm going to have to change, you know, the literature review and other things, but fine. Okay, let's do it. Uh, being creative, okay, because it entails creativity, because when everything's going well, and I don't know at what point you guys are in the process of writing your thesis, some of you, I guess, have finished, others not, but it does entail a lot of creativity, uh, being resourceful, and basically asking for help. Um, so I had one or two people help me, and the rest I kind of came up with, and I would check, I would run everything by my supervisor, and when he would say, no, I think that's a good idea, um, I just went ahead. So these were the hurdles I faced, and I can't say they were easy, but they were definitely um, the only way to go at that point. So this is 2017, which I just mentioned to you. And I want to give you a little bit of uh, background information on my study and why it was important to conduct this study here in Brazil. Uh, well, for the first reason, uh, OER um, are currently present in two goals of the Brazilian National Education Plan which is focused on increased national marks for the index of basic education development for the fundamental education cycle, which is equivalent to grades one through nine, okay, uh, for those of you who work in other K-12 systems. And strategies to increase this index include improving teaching, disseminating educational technologies, and providing digital technological resources for pedagogical use, and OER can be used in all of these strategies. In addition, in 2011, the City of Sao Paulo decreed that all educational resources uh, used by the city uh, should be licensed under Creative Commons license. However, uh, with this policy or without this policy, nothing was happening in the way of OER. Uh, so that was another reason why it was important to conduct study. Now, I've added in here a new policy, which is uh, worthwhile noting. Uh, on May 16, 2018, 
So that was just this last year. Our Ministry of Education um, published a new ordinance uh, that establishes criteria for acquisition of educational resources aimed at basic education produced with the Ministry's financial resources. And the normative document sets out the definitions and differences between open and free educational resources and establishes in its articles that educational resources acquired or produced with public funds should always be open. So this is something that just came out this last year and which is very good. And in a recent research that I carried out for UNESCO IIT, which is kind of um, the status, uh, the state of the art of OER in Brazil, I learned that currently there are approximately 18, believe it or not, OER policies in Brazil, which shows that during the past decade, there have been great advancements in terms of establishing laws, ordinances, and recently the launching of a platform with clear policies on copyright and reuse of resources here in Brazil. So considering that the open education and OER field are heavily dominated by the Global North and their organizations, and the fact that there is almost no funding or very little funding for continuous actions, nor translations of local production into other languages, there are still many challenges for Brazil to overcome, despite its many achievements and advancements in the OER movement. At any rate, um, when I found out doubt about this decree and, and these goals, um, I noticed that in the, in the literature, there was a total lack of analysis regarding experience with open digital content in OER, and that raised a red flag. I said, well, there's something going on. And there are also diverse barriers and challenges that impact OER uptake for the average K-12 public school teacher, which includes readiness for change and innovation, possessing computer or ICT literacy, and institutional support, to name a few. So uh, basically, the provision of teacher professional development uh, to ensure effective practices is imperative. Yet, at the time um, that I undertook my study, there were no already made uh, TPD programs for OER uptake in the Brazilian K-12 public school sector. So uh, my study aimed at addressing this gap by making an intervention in one Brazilian fundamental education public school to plan, design, and implement a face-to-face -face OER development program, which I coined as ODP, for the teachers to participate in the study and measure its effectiveness in terms of awareness raising strategies, content taught, and instructional approaches utilized so as to extract a set of evidence-based OER guidelines in the context of TPD for Brazilian fundamental education public school teachers. So this study was guided by three research questions. And the first one um, is what factors influence Brazilian fundamental education public school teachers' adoption and use of OER in professional practice? The second question, what role, if any, can TPD play in teachers' OER adoption decisions? And the third question, based on research findings from research question one and two, what are a set of evidence-based OER guidelines in the context of teacher professional development? So this study basically contributes uh, more specifically to the fields of curriculum pedagogy by gaining new insights on teacher professional development for OER implementation uptake within K-12 by raising awareness and building knowledge on OER use in this context and by providing a set of evidence-based OER guidelines uh, for professional development. On this slide, you can see the methodology and the research design in my study. And here on the left-hand side is the quantitative portion of the study, which I'm not going to address at this time. Uh, the Utah survey questionnaire um, was used to assess uh, the intention of stakeholders uh, to adopt and use OER. However, only 10 teachers responded to the online uh, questionnaire. So the data is not statistical. 
uh, most of the qualitative findings. So I use a single case study methodology with mixed methods, okay? And uh, the OER development course, the OBC, uh, was, compri was comprised basically of five workshops. Um, so during the first workshop, what I did was uh, I gave the participants an overview of what OER, uh, R, the five R's of OER, um, strengths and, and, and limitations, uh, potential benefits of using OER. So basically the first workshop was an informative workshop. Then uh, there were three more workshops, which I call workshop two, workshop three, and workshop four, uh, which were face-to-face -face workshops as, as well, uh, where I used the design thinking approach. And this approach um, is very used very well used in K-12 because it basically addresses the needs of teachers who will implement innovation and the infrastructure that enables it. It's based on teachers' needs and local context, and it's a bottom-up, not top-down process, which is very much in line with my main objective because I did not want to impose OER adoption use in this context. So the workshop two, um, I propose the following problem uh, to the participants. How can we use digital resources to improve our pedagogical practices? And in the context of this study, digital resources refer specifically to OER use. However, they also can refer to ICT use, which are in this context considered an important avenue to OER use. So during workshop two, participants were asked to list their services and doubts in regards to the problem proposed. Uh, during workshop three, participants were asked to list strategies and solutions in regards to the, strategy, uh, to the services and doubts they had raised in workshop two. And during workshop three, participants were asked to build like an initial prototype of how they would actually overcome the challenges they, raised, they had raised in workshop two and workshop three. Uh, well, due to time constraints um, and other constraints, um, the teachers were not actually able to build the prototype, but that would be the next step. Uh, so data for the design thinking workshops uh, were analyzed using Miles Lieberman's deductive uh, approach, and it was, and, was based on Warshaw's framework for effective use of ICTs. Um, and this framework consists of the following resources, physical resources, digital resources, human resources, and social resources. And I found this framework to be a very good fit um, for the study because uh, Warshaw's framework speaks to the need for literacy and competency when using ICTs, which are an important avenue for OER use. And during the last workshop, uh, focus groups were conducted. Uh, and you can see here the number of participants. So I had 30 teachers participate in, in the workshops. But during uh, the focus groups, um, the number is smaller, not because there were less teachers, but because I divided the teachers into groups, OK? Into three different groups, and I had spokespeople, OK? Uh, so data for the focus groups were analyzed using a generic inductive coding approach, uh, which yielded four main categories. Interest and motivation, knowledge obtained, support obtained, and effective type of TPD in OER for teachers. And here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see uh, the literature review. So going on over some of the findings for the design thinking workshops, which were aimed at answering research question one. Uh, so in terms of human resources, the findings show that teachers in this context, uh, they lack basic technology or ICT skills. However, they want for long term to be, develop their ICT skills to use not only OER, but to be able to implement technology in their pedagogical practices. Uh, the findings also show that technology helps teachers of days in their practices and engages students in the learning process. 
And also, it was interesting to find out that teachers um, think that the students uh, are more proficient in technology uh, than they are. This is really a misconception. Uh, in terms of digital resources, the findings showed that teachers are already using the internet to search for images, videos, and music to supplement instructional content, but they're not necessarily looking for OER because they don't know how to do so. Well, they had never heard about OER, so they would naturally not be looking for OER. Other factors such as accessibility, language issues, reliability of sites, and where to find quality material adversely impacts teachers' ability to use OER in this context. In terms of social resources, factors such as lack of time, lack of personnel, low salaries, only one computer teacher at the school, and there is only one computer lab at the school, at the school external websites uh, which are blocked by administration, lack of vision, plan, and support from administration, and teachers feeling professionally undervalued by authorities also adversely impacts their ability to use OER in this context. And finally, in terms of physical resources, factors such as obsolete equipment in the teacher's room, computers and other multimedia equipment being available only in the computer lab, and poor, if any, Wi-Fi connectivity. And a lot of times I was there, there was absolutely no Wi-Fi connectivity also adversely impacts their ability to use OER in this context. Um, this slide shows the findings from the focus groups which were conducted uh, post ODP and the focus groups were aimed at answering research question two. And for the categories interest and motivation, the findings showed that the teachers were interested in participating uh, in the ODP due to its relationship with ICT skills. Uh, they were motivated to learn and reflect on new practices. And the findings also showed that upon completion of the ODP, the teachers still had a misconception in regards to the five R's of OER. And this was pretty natural because actually we just spoke about the five R's of OER at the beginning of the first workshop. So we didn't go into them again during the other workshop. So they, they, they still hadn't grasped uh, what the five R's of OER Really were. In terms of knowledge gain, new knowledge was gained because teachers had never heard about or considered using OER in their professional practices. And the findings also showed that there was a change in teachers' attitudes and conception with regards to OER use upon completion of focus groups. So I had teachers like say to me, wow, if, if I had known that OER existed, I mean, I would have resorted to them before and I would have used them before. And it was really interesting to learn about OER. So I had these kind of statements. Uh, in terms of support obtained, support was limited to teachers' participation only in the workshops. And when the teachers were asked which incentives, policies, or other actions would provide further support for activity program in OER, the teachers managed factors such as increasing salary, which is unlikely to happen. Um, the use of mobile, mobile phones for DVD, and that is something that could happen, and better school infrastructure, which definitely is something that is quite possible um, to occur as well. And finally, in terms of the effective type of DVD and OER for teachers, uh, all the teachers stated that they wanted practical, hands-on DVD that teaches them step-by-step -step how to differentiate between open and closed resources and how to assemble and repurpose OER and ongoing facilitated support. So this kind of TPD should provide teachers with the necessary support for fully engaged engagement and learning in order to progressively lead them to empowerment and provide them with the autonomy and confidence required to learn about OER. So, all the data collected um, and analyzed yielded the TPD guidelines for OER uptake, uh, which indicate that different kinds of support are needed. And actually, in my thesis, um, the guidelines can be seen um, in a table format, but here for this webinar and during all my presentations, I've kind of shown it as a mental map because it's easier to visualize. But Due to time constraints, we're not going to be able to go over each and every one of the, the guidelines, but you can 
read them later. I'm just interested in seeing the guidelines. Uh, basically, the guidelines have been divided into four main factors policy support, organizational support, infrastructure support, and TPD support. And under each factor, who are uh, the main actors, what are the recommended actions, and how these actions can be undertaken. Uh, so as you can see here, I ended up with more uh, professional development um, guidelines or you know, TPD support than any other uh, kind of, because I think this is where the main focus was. I was not so much focused on the policy, although the policy, the school does need policy because the government, school administration, local authorities usually dictate policies. But anyway, um, these were just some uh, guidelines that arose from the data. So basically, clear policies, organizational and pedagogical support, and availability, availability of proper tools to stimulate and enhance engagement with OER in this context. So uh, now I'd like a little bit of interaction. Yeah, Igor, you're right. You need a magnifying glass for the slide. <laughs> Um, that's why you can access my thesis. And also, I've included at the end of the slides uh, actually the table formats. Uh, so you're able to see them um, on the GoGN website. So now I'd like to, um, uh, I'd, like, I'd like you to interact and, and reflect and, and discuss a little bit about the use of case study methodology. Uh, so I have uh, three questions here, and you can just type them in the chat. I think it'll take you about, I don't know how we are for time, but about five minutes, I guess. Um, my first question is, how helpful are case studies to researchers, considering that most um, case studies are, are in a, a bounded setting or bounded context, uh, which usually has its particularities? Uh, the second question is, what are the weaknesses and strengths of using case study methodology to generate theory that subsequently translates into practice? And the third question is, what are some of the characteristics of a good case study? And I guess all of you scholars will be able to answer that quite well. Uh, so if you can just, you know, reflect a while and jot down some ideas so that we can later discuss them. Go ahead as soon as you're ready. Okay, so Chris has had helpful as have the potential to give us deep insights into a particular often complex situation. There are multiple and single case studies that present different opportunities, I think. Well put, Chris. Uh, Verena says case studies provide depth to research that isn't always there with the survey. Respect the voice. Great point, Verena. Colin, the richness of Qualitative data can overcome challenges in gathering quantitative data. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, crazy to generalization, not really desirable, possible. Well, that's a great question um, and a great point as well, Chrissy. And I know that you know about case studies. 
Um, all the while, I hope I'm not pronouncing or mispronouncing your name, but they sometimes help generate new ideas. Yes, definitely. Okay, question three. Honest, transparent, data is presented holistically and critically. Yeah, well, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I think all research should, should be presented honestly and transparently and critically. And Colin says, in my mind, uh, positive studies serve as an excellent foundation to further quantitative studies to generate new questions and ideas as per Alawali. Uh, Sorry, Alawali, if, if I'm pronouncing, mispronouncing your name. But yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Um, about more questions, yeah, really important. Oh, thank you, good to know. So I guess we have a lot of uh, rich feedback there. Does anybody else want to add anything else um, about case study methodology? Um, or can I continue? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, I'll, I, I will talk about that, definitely. I will, I will mention the benefit. Okay, fantastic. So, well, if further questions um, arise after, we can, we can talk about them later. You know, in the end, I think that using case study uh, was more beneficial than design-based research. Uh, because anyway, I did not really want, I was not interested in really um, generalizing my, my findings. And that is one of the myths um, of, uh, that Flyberg points out, that findings of a single case cannot be generalized. And therefore, a single case study cannot contribute to scientific development. Well, I was absolutely uh, not concerned at all about generalizing my findings, but also um, there was a great, another great benefit, which is that um, I know for a fact that most um, K-12 public schools here in Brazil are basically homogeneous. I mean, they, they suffer from the same um, lack of infrastructure, they have to follow guidelines. So there are some schools, depends on the district you are, that are better equipped, uh, but, and there's some schools that are worse equipped. So uh, I know that there was some kind of, uh, that they were homogeneous in a sense. So that was a great benefit uh, for me, but not that I was that interested. I just wanted to paint um, a real picture uh, of, of what happened in, in a certain instance and during a study and um, convey that to my audience. And if that made any sense, then uh, that people could use uh, later test the guidelines and see if it worked. Uh, so coming back to this first myth of misunderstandings about uh, case studies being generalized and, and you guys brought that up as, as, as well. Uh, regarding this assertion, uh, Flyberg contends that more discoveries have arisen for up, from observation and carefully chosen experiments or exploratory studies than from statistics applied to large sample groups. Um, so formal ge generalization, be it on the basis of a large samples or single cases, is considerably overrated as the main source of scientific progress. And I think this is something that we as researchers have been 
seeing more and more often, more people resorting uh, to using uh, qualitative approaches and not quantitative, quantitative approaches. Um, for my master's degree, I used mixed methods, so I was kind of comfortable using both. Um, and Feinberg uh, further adds that knowledge that cannot be formally generalized does not mean that it cannot enter uh, into the collective process of knowledge accumulation in a given field or in society. So the underlying assumption of this is that a case study can certainly be a valuable uh, to this process, even when it makes no attempt to generalize. Uh, so it, you know, the guidelines could maybe be generalizable here in Brazil, but they might not be generalizable in other countries or in other contexts. Uh, it depends a lot on the country. For example, I just saw a study uh, coming out of Africa, and I saw that there were um, some things that were very similar uh, about infrastructure and so on and so forth. Uh, the second myth or misunderstanding, uh, yes, exactly, but others can learn from your, from your findings. Uh, so the second myth or misunderstanding that um, Feinberg points out um, is that the case study contains a bias toward uh, verification in that it may be selective, biased, personal, and subjective, and is not easy open to cross-checking. Well, regarding the bias toward verification, the case study contains no greater bias toward verification of the researcher's preconceived notion than other methods of inquiry. On the contrary, experience indicates that the case study contains a greater bias towards falsification of preconceived notions than toward verification. And let me explain to you guys uh, what falsification means. In this sense, falsification refers to the proximity between researchers and research participants that the case study design entails. So understanding the case is akin to, um, to a learning process, as is in any learning process. So for me, uh, really undertaking this case study was a major learning process because I really didn't have that many preconceived notions before I entered the field, although I had the literature review. Uh, and then I learned a lot from the participants. Um, so it was really um, a rich process for me in terms of uh, what I took away from that, and, and I guess from what they took away from what was happening during the design thinking workshops. And the last myth or misunderstanding is that the case study is most useful for generating hypotheses, while other methods are more suitable for hypothesis testing and theory building. And I think a few of you mentioned that. So with regards to this third uh, myth or misunderstanding, uh, Weinberg contends that the case study is useful for both generating and testing of hypotheses but is not limited to these research activities alone. And one thing that's very important about case studies, which I found out uh, through the literature, is, is that in any case study, uh, you, might, you may produce an overly complex theory as a result of intensive use of empirical evidence, or you may end up with a really narrow and idiosyncratic theory. And you know, balancing these two, um, it's quite a challenge. Uh, so with, with these potential limitations in mind, I try to focus on producing what I consider to be a parsimonious, when you guys look at my guidelines, um, you can attest to that or not, testable and logically coherent theory or set of insights for teacher professional development in OER, which were derived from data, on-site observation, and my journal reflections during all the workshops. Okay, so uh, what is next? Okay, uh, practical implications for professional development. Well, the TPD guidelines that resulted uh, from this study, they are not by any means intended to be prescriptive. Uh, however, they can provide some direction for policymakers 
teacher educators or school administrators who wish to promote the adoption use of OER. Um, sorry, I just received a message here. Which of the adoption use of OER in the Brazilian, I'm wrapping up, okay, uh, in the Brazilian public fundamental education system. And the guidelines can also be adapted, as Greg stated, uh, to local needs and context. But more importantly, in order to achieve effective outcomes through the use of the guidelines, school administrators and teachers need to embrace the idea of using OER. So I started out the guidelines with the policy support factors because the policy provides directives and rules the organizational infrastructure and TPD factors. And teachers engagement with OER depends on clear policies that provide directives and rules for their adoption and use. And ease of use with available infrastructure and tools and effective pedagogical support may enhance teachers engagement with these resources in addition stimulating their use. So although this study addresses an important gap on teachers' use of OER and the TPD required, more specifically in the Brazilian K-12 public school system, the integration adoption of OER impact teaching requiring emphasis on improving instructional strategies. So you can see here on the slide, this is a very time-consuming, slow, gradual process. And well, I was very happy to learn the last um, conference at Delft that more attention is now being given to K-12 because until now, a lot of the attention on OER adoption use is given to higher uh, um, education institutions. And I think we should be building this from the base, which is from K-12. Um, so I'm happy that this study um, is one of the many that can contribute to this sector. Um, so uh, having said that, the introduction of OER can, can definitely save costs for institution. Um, I, I don't know how many of you um, are probably aware, but since 2015, um, Brazil has been facing a very uh, bad economic recession. So, of course, uh, we could deeply benefit from the use of OER, and it could save uh, our K-12 institutions a lot of costs. And also can be an important avenue for the much needed uh, innovation and change in the cultural mindset of teachers in the setting. And that is something which I find that, um, you know, the teachers really need to start uh, incorporating more ICTs uh, in their pedagogical practice. They have to, uh, you know, be more up to date with what we call 21st century learning and teaching. Anyway, I've been questioned several times about what I mean by 21st century learning and teaching, but uh, well, I'd like to wrap up this presentation. I don't know if I'm over time or on time. Anyway, uh, with this wonderful picture, uh, because the GoGN uh, network, GoGN members, um, peers, and, and the team, the GoGN uh, team, they played a very important role in helping me and providing me with emotional, moral, and even financial support throughout my study. And this picture, actually, uh, some of you were there last year, um, was the highlight. Uh, I really love this picture as well. And it was the highlight of my, I guess, my PhD career. <laughs> one of the highlights of my PhD career because I had just defended uh, my thesis and I knew that I had still minor corrections to go through when I came back to Brazil, but I was just like, wow, well, the work is done. And then when I came back for two weeks, I sat down and made all the alterations that the committee had required. But I met so many amazing people and the GoGN members, like they were from members here. Unfortunately, Dee is no longer with us, but Mark, you're doing a fantastic job. And Fred Mulder is no longer with us as well. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he was also a fantastic man. Uh, but at least about four um, members from the GoGN, uh, they were willing to review my guidelines and they gave me invaluable feedback. And based on their feedback, I was able to improve a lot of my guidelines. 
and just you know it's like just checking to make sure that i was like on the right track and a lot of people do this totally on a voluntary basis so yes thank you group jan and that basically wraps up my presentation and i'm now ready for any questions you may have thank you very much um just show you guys that um after the references here are the guidelines okay and here they are in the table format this will be online if you don't feel like reading through all my pieces because i know sometimes it can be a drag but anyway um just so that you have access to them in an easier way so thank you very much and i'm open to any questions anybody has Fabulous. Thanks, Vivian. That was really, really interesting. So for any to see it on the chat, if you don't mind, please just type your questions there and then we can pick them up as we go along. Let's see what we get. So Vivian, while we're waiting just for the questions to be typed there, um, so practical tips when you're approaching schools to do some of your research, have you got any practical approaches, one takeaway tip that you must do for dealing with teachers in schools? Uh, well, it's important that you know at least um, somebody from, you know, because uh, here in Brazil, like, I don't know if that's all of it. It's the same way. There is the school director, then there is a vice director, and there is the ped pedagogical coordinator. And I knew the vice director of this school, uh, and he was the one who introduced me. So it's good for you to know an insider. But he, uh, as soon as I began really uh, the study, um, he was relocated to another school. So no, just for you to go to go in, it's it's a good thing for you to know somebody, an insider from the school. Who can it introduce you to um, at least the school administration? And another thing is, it's very important to establish a good rapport and empathy with the teachers. And as I was a total outsider, um, that was the first thing that I did. And after my first workshop with them, they actually clapped. I mean, I was really happy I got this. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm not here to threaten. You. I'm not here to take away anything from you. I'm here to give you something if you're interested in learning about it. So uh, I think establishing rapport and, and knowing somebody from inside the school helps a lot, especially when, when you don't work in this area. So those would be my tips. Um, Verena has a question. I have a question about K-12. I noticed in one slide you point out uh, teachers look for videos, pictures, but not OER and you or research. Uh, did K-12 OER have to be 5R? Why or why not? Uh, no, what I noticed, Verena, is we were not focusing on the 5R. Um, well, that was one point. My committee, um, two of my committee members really said, well, you know, for OER to be OER, they have to, they have to comply with the 5Rs. And I really do not totally agree with that. Uh, I don't think they have to be they have to comply with the five bar uh, to be OER. Um, but the teachers are already resorting uh, to all kinds of videos, pictures, images, um, even you know, lesson plans, audio, and so on. But they're finding the internet, but they're not looking for OER. But so that is my take on this. I do not think. At this point, especially with K-12, that they do have to comply with the 5R. Uh, some people are more strict about that, and they say that they have to comply with the 5R. It would be good because then um, eventually uh, they would be able to redistribute them. But we haven't gotten to that point yet, so um, this might take on that. I wouldn't be so strict. Um, so, you see, you said to finish your study. 
uh, what is your way forward to make informed changes to the school sector? Well, uh, my next plan now, Chrissy, uh, really on a practical level, because ever since I've been since I finished my my thesis, um, I really had to go back to work uh, because for about six months I was like not working, so I was very focused on working and making money and all that. So um, now what I'm really looking forward to doing is publishing two articles. One article will be published in English in an open access journal, of course, um, and the second article will be translated into Portuguese because I think uh, that a lot of people here in Brazil are not aware of my study and I'd like to make it aware and a lot of people do not speak English so the only way I can get them really to be able to implement these guidelines is if they're able to uh, re be able to read them and I think uh, so it should be translated into Portuguese. Uh, Colin asked me, not likely enough to extend to this right now, but I'm curious how case studies or qualitative methods in general can be used to test hypotheses. Well, yeah, uh, Colin, I don't think there is time to address this right now. And I, I would also be curious about that because we don't usually use qualitative methods to test hypotheses. We usually use quantitative methods. So I think that would be an excellent discussion topic. Um, maybe we can have a, a webinar on that. Um, so Chris says, uh, how about also speaking in schools about this work? Yeah, Chris, uh, that, that is something that I've already considered doing. Um, it's not very easy to go into public schools. As I said, you need to know an insider from there. Um, but I, since I do know one, I think I could do that. Of course, that takes a lot of work, you know, uh, going from school to school and offering them. And I also like to be off. Uh, to offer them the course that I um, developed, which is hosted in, in a federal university, and they would receive a diploma or accreditation for taking the course. Uh, so Colin says, indeed, I thought you mentioned the reference that suggested that it could be used as a hypothesis. Yes, Kleinberg did mention that, but he, uh, he did not go into depth about that. Uh, so I cannot give you an answer, but he he did mention that, and that is Flyberg. That is not Vladimir who is saying that. And that's a good point. It's also for, to to look for other avenues for dissemination. But I look at school conferences. Yes, uh, that's a great point. Excellent. Okay, so although we started a little bit late, we are well on schedule. So thank you, Vivian. Um, if there's no other questions, I would just like to say thank you to everybody for coming. It's fabulous to have you all here. Thank you very much to Vivian for taking the time to spend with us. See, as Martin said at the beginning, this presentation will be put up online with the video, and you are free always to contact one another through that GoGM link to make sure maybe Colin even raise your question via Twitter to the GoGM group and see what other people think about some of these things. Um, and you're free obviously to contact Vivian as well via her Twitter account. Sorry Viv, just getting everybody to contact you. Um, but thank you, thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar which we will announce shortly. So take care and have a good morning, afternoon and evening, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you all.